Tonight, the battle for Quebec. How the leaders are trying to hold back a surging bloc. And Doug Ford faces the cameras. His response to Justin Trudeau's election attacks. I think the guy loves me or something because he constantly mentions my name. Donald Trump's tough talk on the Kurds, one-time allies. They're no angels. Greta Thunberg in Alberta, why her welcome isn't so robust. And Malcolm Gladwell, the Canadian thinker, has thoughts on the upcoming election. What if you were just told it's A, B, C, D, E, and F? Here's what they believe in. Make your choice. This is The National. With time ticking down, momentum is building in this federal election campaign. Yeah, there are just four full days left to win voters over. So today was about going big for the Conservatives. That meant wading through crowds at campaign stops in southwestern Ontario. The Liberals picked up an interesting endorsement. Former U.S. President Barack Obama tweeted his support for Justin Trudeau. And the NDP was leaning on a legacy in battleground Quebec. And Rosie, that province in particular got a lot of attention. Today. Yeah, and it's going to continue to get attention, Andrew, into Monday. Rallies, speeches, all kinds of handshaking going on in La Belle Province today by most of the party leaders and for good reason. As Evan Dyer lays out, there are, after all, 78 seats at stake and the Bloc Québécois is now surging in the polls. In the campaign today, Quebec took centre stage because the seats in this province aren't just up for grabs. They're also must-haves for either Liberals or Conservatives if they want a majority. The orange wave of 2011 saw the NDP capture 59 Quebec seats. The wave receded in 2015, but 14 new Democrats are still clinging on. It's been widely assumed that almost all of those 14 seats may be lost this time around. And both Liberals and Conservatives need to win some of them to have a real shot at a majority. Je ne suis pas comme les autres. But Jagmeet Singh has worked hard to overcome Quebecers' first impressions in a province where many recoil from religious symbols. And I wanted to make it clear in Quebec that, you know, despite maybe differences of appearances, uh, I share the same values. The debates also helped Singh, but even more importantly, they strengthened the Bloc Québécois. Many Quebecers felt Yves-François Blanchet was the winner. And today it was clear who Liberals see as their main rival in the province. The bloc exists to fight against a, Quebec, uh, a federal government that doesn't understand Quebec. We've demonstrated that we, as a team of Quebecers, are always there to stand up for Quebec values and indeed Canadian values. At a Legion Hall on Quebec's south shore, a reminder that bloc supporters tend not to like Liberals. <laughs> But it's the Conservatives who depend on the same voter pool of mostly older white francophones. And Andrew Scheer's efforts to woo Quebec voters have mostly fallen flat. He behaves like an evicted lover who's trying to convince that he's still in love. The bloc hasn't ruled out working with any minority government on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. But Blanchette has made it clear his party won't help Scheer kill the carbon tax or build pipelines and it certainly won't let him put an energy corridor across Quebec. Jamais Quebecers, he said today, would never forgive us if we did that. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. In Ontario, a whole other political dynamic is playing out. The progressive Conservative Premier Doug Ford stepped up to the mic today for the first time in an awfully long time. As Cameron McIntosh explains, he's been mostly missing in this campaign, except for all those times the Liberals have brought him up. Remember this guy? Ontario Premier Doug Ford has been keeping a low profile for weeks. Thank you, Mayor, and it's great to be back in Kenora. Breaking his silence today in Kenora, Ontario, with a very local funding announcement. Our government is investing $3.9 million to resurface Railway Street. Not exactly a bombshell. Justin Trudeau has been invoking Ford's name all through the election campaign, using his track record as a warning to progressive voters. Questioned about that today? This from Ford. I think the guy loves me or something because he constantly mentions my name. And... In other words, the Premier's just not biting. Here in northwestern Ontario, Kenora is about as far away as you can get from Queen's Park and still be in the province. Premier Ford hasn't made an official public appearance since September 17th. Ford's controversies followed him here. <laughs> Greeted today by teachers protesting education cuts, it's the link Trudeau is trying to pin on Scheer. In an often forgotten corner of Ontario, this is a swing seat. Ford's influence on the federal vote 
depends on who you ask. Definitely Premier Ford has a lot to do with my vote. He has no bearing on my vote at all. Like the Liberals, the Conservatives need every bit of Ontario they can get. While Scheer has brought in Alberta's Premier to campaign here, Ford has not been asked. I told Andrew Scheer right from the get-go I'm, I'm not getting involved. Scheer only mentions Ford's name when asked and says it's not an issue for his candidates. Not once have they ever got a question at the doors from a voter asking which provincial politicians are campaigning with you. With days to go, Trudeau will keep trying to link Ford and Scheer as he did today in Quebec. Where Quebecers need to stand up and fight is against those like Jason Kenney and Doug Ford. Ford, meanwhile, is simply insisting he's just focusing on governing Ontario. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Kenora. So just one more note on that Obama endorsement today. It is rare for a former U.S. president to endorse a Canadian candidate during a federal election. In doing just that today, Barack Obama called Justin Trudeau a hard-working, effective leader and said the world needs his progressive leadership now. Obama has done this kind of thing before. In 2017, he backed French presidential candidate Emmanuel Macron. While he was still in office, he endorsed German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Back then, Trudeau and Obama had a close working relationship. They've also met up a couple times since. Today, Trudeau thanked Obama. I appreciate the, uh, the kind words, and I'm working hard to keep our progress going. So what does his main opponent think of this? Uh, I've got millions of Canadians like the ones here tonight behind me. I'm not uh, very interested in what uh, former foreign leaders are saying. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh also weighed in saying he's got a lot of respect for Obama, but this time, quote, he's wrong. Adrian. All right, Rosie. The current U.S. president suffered a blow today from within his own ranks as criticism mounted against his removal of troops from northern Syria. The region is sinking into more conflict, and that could help ISIS rise from the ashes. But as Stephen D'Souza shows us, Donald Trump sees a rosier picture. In northern Syria, the fighting raged on between Turkish-backed forces and the Kurds, once U.S. allies in the fight against the Islamic State. Now, terrorists themselves, according to Donald Trump. Now, the PKK, which is a part of the Kurds, as you know, is uh, probably uh, worse at terror and more of a terrorist threat in many ways than ISIS. Trump today seemingly washed his hands of events that he himself helped set in motion. I'm not going to get involved in a war between Turkey and Syria, especially when, if you look at the Kurds, and again, I say this with great respect, they're no angels. Trump spun his decision as fulfilling a campaign promise to bring soldiers home and stop endless wars. Sounds very much like a, a, a Russian talking point. But this former Turkish politician points out those 28 U.S. soldiers were keeping the peace. Uh, of all of Washington's involvements in the Middle East, uh, this one wa had uh, the smallest footprint. Uh, it cost the, the least, and it was the most effective. Now even Republicans are critical. We're about to destroy the best ally we've had on the ground in the fight against ISIS. That would be a uh, dishonorable act. The A's are 354. In the House of Representatives, more than 120 Republicans joined Democrats in condemning Trump's actions. He was shaken up by it. Later, Democrats said they walked out of a face-to-face -face with Trump, calling him insulting with no plan to deal with the mess he created. The witness on the part of the president was a meltdown. Sad to say. Trump responded with a flurry of tweets, not about policy, but accusing the Democrats of having an unhinged meltdown. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. A letter emerged today that Donald Trump wrote to Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, one week ago, seemingly to discourage an incursion into Syria. At first, people thought it might be fake, but the White House confirmed Trump really did tell Erdogan, quote, let's work out a good deal. You don't want to be responsible for slaughtering thousands of people, and I don't want to be responsible for destroying the Turkish economy, and I will. I have worked hard to solve some of your problems. Don't let the world down. He concluded, don't be a tough guy. Don't be a fool. I will call you later. We have breaking news on a story we first brought you yesterday. The newlywed couple detained in Turkey since July has been released. 
Katie Nicholson has the latest. So, Katie, uh, what happened here? Well, CBC News has confirmed that Halima Mustafa and E. Carmel, they're heading home to Canada. They've been released. Now, as we reported last night, government sources in Canada and Turkey told us the couple had been detained there since July. They were picked up at the Turkish-Syrian border um, on suspicion of terror-related activity. Now, the case was deemed confidential within the Turkish court system. Sources now tell us that they were released today without charges. Any idea of how this happened? Well, it really appears that this was a case of bad judgment. Uh, the couple was in Turkey for a vacation. They decided to drive to the Syrian border. They were in an area that's known for human smuggling. Uh, and also, it's a, it's a hot spot for foreign fighters attempting to enter Syria. And it was that decision that landed them in Turkish custody for three months on suspicion of terror-related activities. Now, as we reported last night, multiple sources told us they were not on any kind of watch list while they were in Canada. But while they were detained, people who knew the couple, they confirmed to us that RCMP were coming to them trying to find out if they had been radicalized. So tonight, we have reached out to family members, to the RCMP and to the government for official comment. And so far, we really haven't heard anything. But they're coming home. They are coming home. All right, Katie, thanks very much. You're welcome. Police have smashed an alleged human trafficking ring that spans several provinces. During a year-long investigation, they charged 31 suspects with more than 300 counts related to trafficking and fraud. Ioana Rumiliotis tells us how they cracked the case, and she spoke with women who managed to break away from being sold for sex. There's no sound on this police video, but the ugly story behind it speaks volumes. This arrest, part of a crackdown on a sprawling fraud and sex trafficking network, that forced dozens of young women to have sex all day, every day. They are controlled uh, emotionally. Uh, they're controlled through violence, through threats of violence. They're controlled, uh, some with uh, drugs and alcohol. Um, and they're manipulated and uh, psychologically uh, beaten down on a daily basis. Police say the case unraveled after they were contacted by two women from Quebec who say they were lured to Ontario and forced into the sex trade. In the last year, police identified 12 victims at several locations and laid more than 100 human trafficking charges. It may appear that these females that are involved in uh, the sex trade, so to speak, are willing participants. That is not true. We have seen the horrific things that are happening to these to these women. So I'm Carly. I Carly am, uh, Church knows Healy that Worker too well. A survivor of human trafficking, program? she has helped police understand the twisted bond between victim and pimp. She's coming to... Now she works with police in Ontario's Durham region to help victims break free. They are fearful and they are confused and they're unsure of what next steps are. That fear of the unknown is really real and who's going to take care of me? Who's going to look after me? Who's going to meet my needs? How am I going to survive without this person? Um, and who is ever going to love me again? Mark Dell was 19 when she was trafficked. Her pimps were people she thought were her friends. Now she has this advice to vulnerable young girls and women. If someone's telling you they love you in the first couple of days, if someone's pressuring you to do sexual things or things that you're not comfortable with, that is not love and that's not a real relationship. Police say the investigation is ongoing and believe there are at least 33 other trafficking victims connected to it. They're urging them to come forward with the intent of laying more charges. Joanna Rumiliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Greta Thunberg has brought her fight for climate action to the heart of Canada's oil and gas industry. The 16-year-old Swede is in Alberta, promoting her vision for a greener, cleaner future. But as Carolyn Dunn tells us, her message hasn't won over everyone. Even while trying to keep a low profile, the world's most famous climate activist, Greta Thunberg, is bound to get noticed walking in the corporate heart of Canada's energy industry. But bringing her unflinching demands to Alberta is laying bare just how polarizing the teenager can be. Not everyone is thrilled to have her. Like this person telling her to stay the F out of Alberta. Hashtag not welcome. For every negative... She seems brave and fearless, uh, seems like a place that could use some of the conversation for sure. Uh, Greta Thunberg is in Calgary. She uh, visited downtown earlier today. And some callers to a CBC radio show had some choice words. It's, it's great what she's doing, but she has to stop laying the blame. 
on on uh, my generation and generation before for stealing her childhood. The only person stealing her childhood is, is herself. Oil and gas veteran Dave Yeager says Thunberg's message is problematic. As in the end, if you remove fossil fuel from the economy, the conclusion I came to is the cure is worse than the disease. But this ER doctor and climate activist applauds what she's saying. And she is, is, is waking people up to the fact that that's, that's a great party, but the, the party's going to end at some point and we're going to have quite a hangover. There was neither invite nor request for an official meeting with the provincial government. I'd hold out hope that anybody would be willing to look at the objective data, which is that Alberta has the highest environmental human rights and labor standards of any major energy producer on earth. Thunberg was in Calgary reportedly shooting a video. On Friday, she'll lead a climate strike and rally outside the provincial legislature in Edmonton. Her demand? A new green deal to transition to all renewable energy by 2030. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Next on The National, a million dollar drug too expensive to be used and a group of Canadian researchers now trying to find a way to get the drug to patients in need. Plus, Malcolm Gladwell weighs in on the federal election. Our conversation coming up. We have an update to a story CBC News first brought you last fall about a made in Canada medical breakthrough. Glybera is the world's first gene therapy. It's also extremely expensive. A single dose costs $1 million. So the pharmaceutical industry shelved it. But as Kelly Crow reports, a scientist with, an, with the National Research Council saw our story and decided to take action. 10-year-old Felix Lapointe has a potentially deadly genetic disease called lipoprotein lipase deficiency, or LPLD. His body lacks an important enzyme that breaks down fat in food. His mother said Felix went through a period where he couldn't accept he had this illness, and there's still lots of anxiety. For people with LPLD, the fat makes their blood turn white. They can suffer dangerous attacks of pancreatitis. There is no cure, but there used to be a treatment called Glybera. It was developed by Canadian scientists, but when it went on the market in Europe, priced at $1 million, the company only sold one treatment and then abandoned it forever. Last November, a CBC documentary told the, the body, Glybera story. I would like to have seen this go all the way and seen this uh, uh, bring benefit to patients everywhere in the world. Dr. Danica Sinimorovic at the National Research Council saw that story on The National. It was good timing. She had just received new federal funding to develop affordable gene therapies for Canadians. Glybera seemed like an ideal first project. It just happened that the original Glybera story was run on CBC and that really got us thinking that this can be uh, uh, the first in our, uh, in, in lineup of, of projects where we can really make a difference. She immediately called Dr. Michael Hayden. I was just thrilled that we could do something as a national effort to achieve this. National Research Council scientists already have the capacity to make gene therapy delivery systems outside the traditional pharmaceutical industry. So these are therapies for rare diseases. And it's very difficult to make them in a typical pharma-driven model because that drives the, the price of these therapies to astronomical levels. Mm. No, guess we're fine. For Felix Lapointe, though, it's still a long wait for treatment. We've been fighting for 10 years with doors closed, so the possibility that something is coming is encouraging. It will take at least five years before the new version of Glybera is ready to be tested in patients. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Toronto. Quick look now at some of the other stories we're following tonight, starting in the Maritimes, where officials are preparing for a powerful storm that is expected to bring heavy rains and wind gusts of more than 90 kilometres per hour. Nova Scotia Power has activated its emergency operations center as crews work to take down trees weakened by Hurricane Dorian just last month, a storm many are still cleaning up from. Officials say a collapsed crane in downtown Halifax has also been secured in anticipation of more heavy winds. And a month-long strike by General Motors workers in the U.S. could soon be over, and that 
might be good news for thousands of laid off auto workers here in Canada. The strike by nearly 50,000 U.S. workers has halted work at more than 30 GM factories across that country and led to thousands of temporary layoffs at plants in southern Ontario. Today's tentative agreement still needs to be ratified, but GM Canada officials say some Canadian workers could be back at work as early as Friday. And the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is broadening its recall of raw beef and raw veal products. See, earlier this month, the agency announced it had found possible E. coli contamination in some products from a Toronto-based slaughterhouse. Officials have now added dozens more raw beef products to the recall list, including several sold at Walmart, Pusateri's, and Overweighty stores across the country. There have been no reported illnesses. Well, coming up, Malcolm Gladwell on why we're so bad at figuring other people out. How well do we know Donald Trump, or Greta Thunberg for that matter? That's next. It's hard to argue we live in divided times. Opinion and instinct seem to matter more than facts and figures. It can be hard to get some people to even budge from their position. And that has serious consequences for society, even democracy itself. So what's behind that, and can we counter it? Well, Malcolm Gladwell has built a career studying the hidden patterns in our behavior, and in a moment, you'll hear our conversation. But first, a little background. Malcolm Gladwell is one of those thinkers who, even if you don't know the name, you've probably heard his ideas. Take the broken windows theory, that small crimes lead to big crimes. Social phenomena behave like epidemics. Gladwell wrote about it and brought it into the mainstream. Or how about the 10,000 hour rule? How long it takes to truly master something? That's from a Gladwell book too. And he's not only a best-selling author, he's a podcaster, a journalist, and a bit of a rock star. Right now, he's on tour promoting his new book, Talking to Strangers. When we talk about race first, what it allows us to do is to not do anything. Right. I don't know if my mind was changed, but it certainly was opened. Oh, gee, I never thought of it that way before. This one is called Talking to Strangers. It's Gladwell says it's his angriest work yet, where he dissects why we are so bad at figuring out other people, and yet it's something we tend to think we're quite good at. Maybe you think you understand what drives someone like Donald Trump or Greta Thunberg, or maybe you don't. I had a chance to sit down with Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm, very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for making the time. I know you're, you're busy. Not at all. So I've read the book, and, mm. and I know that you've joked about the, the title of the book because mm. it, it sounds like the title of a wonderful self-help book about Breaking yeah. the ice with people yeah. is kind of kind of introverts Bible, but but it's not no. quite that. No, it's the anti self help book. I think in some ways, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I I, I I do have a I suppose a little bit of guilt over um, the fact that the title doesn't exactly telegraph uh, perfectly. It's a book is a little bit dark in places. So in one of the pages, you sum it up quite well, and you say the death of Sandra Bland is mm -hmm. what happens when we don't know how to talk to strangers. Mm. Can you explain why that case sort mm. of formed the basis of, of everything yeah. in this book? Yeah, the book begins and ends with this notorious case from four years ago uh, involving a young African-American woman named Sandra Bland who is in a small town in Texas for a job interview, gets pulled over by a police officer. They get into an argument. He drags her out of the car, arrests her. She commits suicide in her cell three days later. And uh, it's a heartbreaking story on a million levels. They failed at the task of making each other comprehensible, particularly the police officer. He just gets Sandra Bland wrong over and over again. And each time he misunderstands her, the, the situation veers further and further out of control. That was the moment when I first listened to that videotape when the idea for the book kind of crystallized in my head because I, th I thought there was something um, powerfully characteristic of the moment we're living in where you know we're shouting at each other and we're misunderstanding what the other party is saying. You know if we knew look at the way in which particularly communities of color in America and law enforcement 
have come into very sharp conflict over the last several generations. It's because of that. It's because of a deliberate practice of training police officers to be suspicious of, of otherwise innocent activity. You know, I talk in the book about people periodically do large-scale surveys of law enforcement people around the world and ask them, do you think there are reliable indicators that suspects give you when they're lying? And police officers overwhelmingly will say, for example, that if someone's talking to you like this, and they're kind of like, that's, they're lying. They're looking away, they're jiddling with their hands, maybe they're smiling nervously. Right. There is zero, zero evidence that this is a reliable indicator of lying. So because we live in a world now where we are, we are more and more dealing with people who are strangers to us, then the consequences of our, our errors are greater. If you're talking about digital interactions where you're, you're getting little brief, little snippets of somebody, right. then you're in trouble. Except you don't mention social media at no. all in this book, which seems to me like a bit of a peculiar choice in a yeah. book that's entirely about yeah. misunderstanding strangers. Is that something Well, I'm that on you... Twitter. I don't, yeah. I don't take it seriously. There was a moment about six or seven years ago during Arab Spring when everyone thought that Twitter was going to save the world. Did Twitter save the world? No, Twitter's not saving the world. I'm not even convinced that five years from now we're going to be on Facebook or Twitter. I think we're going to get over it. And I honestly think that the way in which the current President of the United States has used and abused that medium is doing more to discredit it as a form of communication than anything else. Mm. The next President of the United States, I'm convinced, will not tweet. I think she will, you know, use much more. She. I think it's reasonable to see it might be a woman. Yeah, I think she's going to use much more meaningful forms of interaction with the American population. And we will be delighted when this happens. Well, okay. Well, well na now you're inviting the follow-up, which is to get Malcolm Gladwell on record with his prediction mm -hmm. for 2020. The floor is yours. I don't have a prediction. It won't, I don't think the current occupant will repeat as president. I think, I think there's going to be somebody new. Um, chances are somebody new will be, there's a number of very strong female candidates. Um, I have a personal preference. I don't know whether she's going to win, but Kamala Harris, her father is Jamaican. Hmm. My mother is Jamaican. Yes. So I emailed her father and said, because he's from the same town where my mother went to school, and he said, well, you know, it's interesting you email me because when I went to university at the University of West Indies, uh, I had a professor who encouraged me to take mathematics, which is why I ended up as an economist and he teaches at Stanford University, Kamala Harris's father. Who was that professor? My father. No kidding. Yeah, so I, in a, if she wins the presidency, I want to make a claim <laughs> that if her father had not met my father, he would not have taken mathematics, he would not have become an economist, which means he would not have met Kamala Harris's mother, which means that Kamala Harris would not have become president. So I'm going to take personal <laughs> Gladwell family credit <laughs> if this happens. <laughs> I, I have to, so let me back up for a second. So you brought up Donald Trump. Uh -huh. Do you think we actually understand Donald Trump? Donald Trump? I think it's a reasonable conclusion that he's a narcissist. We know he doesn't really read things. We know that he's pretty thin-skinned. He's not a stranger to us anymore. In fact, I have more exposure to Donald Trump over the last three years than I do to many members of my own family. I mean, <laughs> I read his tweets every day. I see him on the television. He, I've heard him now speak for what must be combined many hours. So I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that we have some genuine insight into him. To, to, to use the language that you use in the book, is, is Donald Trump an example of someone who is matched or? Oh, he's, he is so matched, it's unbelievable. He is what he appears to be. He is what he appears to be. He tells you what's on his mind. People, I think, stress too much the fact that he's deceitful. I don't think of him as deceitful. So in the case of this most recent uh, scandal, the Ukrainian thing, the, everyone else around him is trying to deceive us. He is totally transparent. I called the man. He just doesn't think it's a crime, right. right? And most of the cases, it's not that he's lying. It's that he genuinely does not see why when he is being himself, that's a problem. And part of his appeal is precisely that. He seems to be highly authentic to those who like him. And that's because he is genuinely representing the contents of his heart on his face. 
what if I flip it? What if we talk about someone like Greta Thunberg? Mm -hmm. A vast number of people uh, revere her, mm -hmm. think of her as a hero. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd be willing to wager they probably don't actually know much about her. Yeah. But, but so many people have come to a snap judgment about mm -hmm. who she is, what she stands for, and what she wants, and what drives her. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, I would say that she's, you know, she's a teenager. My guess is she's going to be around for a long time. So we will have an opportunity to get to know her and to adjust and perfect our understanding of who she is and what her motives are. So this is a classic example of, of what we ought to do when confronted with a stranger, which is it's completely fine to have an impression, but just be willing to update that impression as more information and evidence is gathered. The wrong model is to decide right now that she's either a saint or a fraud and stick to that and stop gathering additional information. I can point to a thousand different ways in which we make that mistake in our, in our lives. We lock ourselves into a position and say, I met that person, I don't trust him, and we walk away. Well, you know, you can't come to an accurate conclusion about whether someone is trustworthy based on 10 seconds of interaction. And, and, and this is, I mean, timely advice particularly because we have a federal election yeah. where people are going to be making judgments, not mm -hmm. just about political parties and about their platforms and policies, but about the leaders. You would say what to them? I would say concentrate on what they believe in and concentrate on what they intend to do and concentrate very little on a personal assessment of your particular beliefs about who they are and what they're like. Because we don't know them. Because you don't know them. Um, and because that can only mislead you. In fact, I've, you know, in my perfect world, we would never meet, personally see the people running for office. We would only hear them. We would hear what they have to say about the, their view of society, what they think the problems are, and how they intend to fix those problems. That's what matters. What if you were just told it's A, B, C, D, E, and F. Here's what they believe in. Make your choice. Malcolm, what a joy to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Interesting idea. Okay, next on The National, they are under 18, but still planning on casting a ballot. Watch my meeting with a group of high school students who are very busy ahead of the federal election. We're back in two. Welcome back. In any federal election campaign, one group that tends to get ignored is high school students. Generally, they're not old enough to vote, but that doesn't mean they're not paying attention. In fact, right now, across Canada, many are gearing up for their own version of this federal election. I visited a class at Michael Power St. Joseph High School in Toronto where politics is part of the daily discussion. Okay, guys, uh, we're going to do here. First thing you notice when you walk into Enrico Kumbo's classroom, there are no textbooks here. No dates to memorize, no definitions to learn, just plenty to talk about. Often political and all with an eye towards voting day. It all comes down to persuasive and manipulative social media. It's very easy to manipulate a teenager's brain into acquiring a certain political stance, whether it be on the left or right. May I just posit one thing? How different is that from adults? There definitely is also misinformation by adults on social media. like. If they see a news story that confirms what they believe politically, they're probably going to share it, and then that just reinforces their belief. And that's actually, in a way, more dangerous because they can vote. But it's different because adults have had more life experience and more time to actually um, make an informed decision in the first place. That seems like a pretty engaged classroom. The kids are very engaged. Mm. Kumbo could have retired some time ago, but teaching is where he feels needed, and he likes to push his students. And what is it that you're trying to do in that classroom? What is your goal? Two words, critical thinking. I, and I mean that emphatically. Now, again, to be clear, none of these students can vote, but before they gain that right, they need to realize their own strength. There's a tremendous underestimation of kids. I've been here 20 years in high school, and I'm oftentimes flabbergasted by the kinds of questions they ask and the observations they make. Your 
Number one issue, what, what do you care about most? Housing and affordability. Housing and affordability, yep. Anna? Climate change. Sorry, um, job opportunities. Jobs, okay, Denise? Um, our education system. Okay, Santiago. I'd also say job opportunities. Job opportunities yeah. as well, Connor? Uh, political accountability. Political accountability. Yeah. The reason for voting is that we want to see some change be put forward by the party that we chose. Uh, if we wait those four years after putting them in office and we don't see that they're doing anything that they promised, uh, it makes us a bit cynical, right? I see some nodding of heads. I mean, is that kind of reflective of the way you guys feel about politics and politicians generally? Um, I feel like for most politicians, their goal is to win over as many people as they can so that they can be in office and then they implement whatever they want to. But with that, there comes a lot of lies. That's the main reason students don't want to vote or don't want to incorporate themselves within politics because we don't know how to tell facts from fiction. They have very astute observations about the problems in society. Uh, they may not be able to know what to do about it, but they have enough acumen to perhaps more than some adults to say, we got problems. And encouraging students to flex that muscle is where Kumbo really shines. So much so that he's not only opened their eyes, he also has them spreading the word about the value of voting. Good morning. We're here to talk to you about Student Vote 2019. Student Vote 2019 is a cross-country initiative that asks students to cast mock ballots in the upcoming federal election. The goal, engage young people early. The tricky part is getting students to take the vote seriously. That's been a problem in past years. So this year, a more concerted effort to give them tools like poll tracker and vote compass and to have their peers be the ones doing the teaching. This could like really influence your political opinion because then you like finally get an opinion as to what each party offers. Politics can usually be seen as a sort of messy subject to talk about in like casual conversation. So having these discussions in class and having that open-minded, um, like safe area to discuss these things without any judgment or lesser amount of judgment is a really good place to start. And to me what matters is that the school then becomes a bridge for these kids going out and understanding what it means to be a Canadian. And not just a Canadian, but a Canadian citizen. Because let's face it, the vote of a lifetime can always be just around the corner. Still ahead on the national, the suit that might go to the moon. NASA unveils a new spacesuit prototype that is next. Welcome back. Many are watching Europe tonight with word the United Kingdom and the European Union could be on the verge of a last minute Brexit deal. The leaders of France and Germany weren't giving details but expressed some optimism at a press conference and in London, cabinet ministers arrived at number 10 Downing to be briefed on negotiations. A summit of EU leaders including Boris Johnson is set to begin tomorrow. And a different kind of catwalk today at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. So look at that. The agency unveiled its next generation spacesuits designed for improved comfort and mobility. They are also supposed to be a better fit for everyone regardless of size. And that is a big deal. Last March, the first all-female spacewalk had to be cancelled when there wasn't a medium-sized suit for astronaut Anne McLean to wear. The new suits are intended for the Artemis program, which could send Americans back to the moon by 2024. And coming up, suits of armor, crocodile skins, and gold decor. We'll take you inside the so-called Museum of Corruption in Ukraine. Earlier, we told you how President Trump took heat today from Republicans over Syria. This while Democrats continue to push for an impeachment inquiry over the Ukraine investigation. Now, anti-corruption leaders in that country are speaking out from what you might call a fitting home base, a museum of corruption. Our Chris Brown went to see what lessons it might hold. Political corruption has been so ingrained in the landscape of Ukrainian politics that there's even a museum of corruption near the capital, Kiev. 
It's a palatial estate built by ex-Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych from $2 billion stolen from Ukraine's treasury. For two people, Yanukovych and uh, girlfriend. <laughs> Yulia, our tour guide, showed us the over-the-top, often gaudy decor featuring suits of armor, crocodile skins, and gold leaf everywhere. Most of this stuff was never used before Yanukovych was chased out of Ukraine in 2014. Some people angry, some people uh, cry. A prominent anti-corruption figure says there's a lesson to be learned from this place and Rudy Giuliani's hunt in Ukraine for political dirt on Donald Trump's opponents. Ukrainian Museum of Corruption and this Giuliani story, both of them are about gray zone of the politics. Sergei Leshenko helped reveal Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, accepted millions of dollars from crooked Ukrainian sources, and Leshenko paid a price for that. At the time, he was in then-president-elect Vladimir Zelensky's inner circle, but Leshenko says Giuliani's accusations that he was part of a democratic conspiracy left Zelensky no choice but to let him go. Because conspiracy does not exist without enemies. And uh, I was one of the targets of this conspiracy. Leshenko worries now that the allegations about Giuliani's actions will hurt the cause of cleaning up politics here. Of course, it was for us a shock. U.S. government was supportive for anti-corruption institutions in Ukraine so many years. The Corruption Museum is meant to ensure Ukrainians never forget the criminality of their former president, but Leshenko says Americans should pay attention too. When that president was in power, we had no understanding how much he was corrupt. Now he says everyone can see powerfully how trusting a nation's leader is not enough. They also have to be kept under control. Chris Brown, CBC News, near Kyiv. Still ahead on the national and emotional video urging Canadians to vote. A Winnipeg woman proves just how powerful one voice can be. That is our moment next. Well, if last weekend's big surge in advanced polls across the country is any indication, many Canadian voters want to be heard this election, even if there are lots of people who feel less than excited about their options. Now, exactly how many will turn out on Election Day proper remains to be seen. Some folks might be too busy, some may forget, maybe some don't bother at all. But one young Canadian is earning praise for making the time when she herself has so little of it left. Her story is tonight's moment. This election marks Madison Yetman's first chance to take part in Canadian democracy as a registered voter. But it's also very likely her last chance. This 18-year-old from Winnipeg was living a happy, active life before a sudden terminal cancer diagnosis. Yet, with possibly just days to live, her determination to vote only grew. She cast her ballot from the hospital this week. Then she made this video encouraging others to make the time with the hashtag, what's your excuse? If I can find the time to vote, you can find the time to vote. It's now been seen and shared hundreds of thousands of times across social media. Elizabeth May, Jugmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau all responded. Yetman's uncle spoke to CBC about the power of her message. It was very important to her that you got a chance to vote and it started a conversation. Here's a kid who's time can be measured in minutes or hours and she took minutes out of there to vote and there's no excuse for every other everybody else who has a lot more time to not get out and vote i think that is a message that resonates with people yeah it's hard to argue with that and you know what one other sentiment that her uncle shared with us was that you know such a powerful gesture was so simple on its face that it just took a handful of white cards some black marker a few takes and Lots of laughs. Apparently. And an amazing family. I, I've seen this video so many times and I cannot s stop imagining what it is like for her family. Right. Uh, inspiring, heartbreaking, uh, but they raised an amazing kid. Mm. That is the National for October 16th. Good night. Good night.